But they said, verse 28, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. And so we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. Abimelech admits that he could see that the Lord God was with Isaac. You know, your life is a witness to people. They see your life. They, they see your relationship with the Lord. They see you following Jesus. They see you walking by faith and trusting the Lord. They see the blessing of the Lord on, on your life. Even people who may re resent you. They can see that the Lord is with you. And, and Abimelech comes... Because he sees that the Lord is with Isaac and that the Lord is blessing Isaac and prospering Isaac, he knows that Isaac is powerful because of his God. And so Abimelech came seeking a treaty with Isaac, kind of a non-aggression treaty here. Now look what he says in verse 29. Abimelech says to Isaac that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. Now, in my Bible, next to verse 29, I wrote the words, say what? Right? We've done nothing to you but good? How about nothing but strife and resentment and quarreling and envy? You, you, you kicked me out of your kingdom, told me I had to leave. That's why I live here in Rehoboth and Beersheba. That's why I ended up, ended up out here. This is, you know, this is another human trait that we see here. People like to rewrite history, and distort the facts and even lie to make themselves look better. You know, I, want, you know, I, I point these things out to you so that you can recognize them when you see them. So, so that when you see someone who is, is, is demonizing success, you can say, wait a minute, that's, that's envy at the root of that. I remember that from Genesis 26. That's what the uncircumcised Philistines did. Or when you see someone rewriting history and distorting the facts, you can say, wait a minute, I remember that from that Bible study right after Christmas. This, this is, this is the, the sin nature of man. Uh, you know, Abimelech, he can't deny that Isaac is blessed of the Lord. He even says so at the end of verse 29. Now look at Isaac's response in verse 30. So he made them a feast. And they ate and drank. You should, you should highlight verse 30 or put a star by it or whatever it is that you do to write in your Bible. Isaac makes a feast for Abimelech and his entourage. Why does he do that? By making a feast for Abimelech, Isaac was communicating forgiveness and reconciliation to Abimelech. You know, Bedouins in the Middle East, they, they still have this practice. Uh, they call it a sulha meal. A sulha meal, it, and, it's, and it's a meal between enemies for the purpose of reconciliation. And the person that was, was victimized or violated or wronged is the person who makes the meal and offers the meal to the perpetrator as a way of extending forgiveness and as a way of communicating forgiveness to that person and, and reconciliation. And this is, a, this is a powerful concept that we find throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one of the most powerful examples of this is after the resurrection. And Jesus, remember, he seeks out Peter and finds Peter on the Sea of Galilee. And what does Jesus do? He prepares a meal for Peter there on the Sea of Galilee. And it says that Jesus served Peter a meal and it's there that Jesus restores Peter. Remember that? If you love me, feed my sheep, that whole thing. That takes place over a meal. Jesus is the one who prepared the meal and invited Peter to come and eat with him. And Jesus serves him. That is communicating forgiveness. 
That is communicating acceptance. That's communicating reconciliation in that culture. Now, Jesus tells us in the Gospels that when we get to heaven, what's he going to do? He's going to serve us a meal. He's going to serve us a meal. And, and, you know, we read that and we think, great, you know, hey, I like eating. That sounds wonderful. Meal in heaven with Jesus. But through that meal, he's communicating to us acceptance. He's communicating forgiveness. He, he's communicating reconciliation through that meal. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone opens the door, I will come in. And what does he say? And I'll sup with you and you with me. Jesus says, I, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door and you invite me in, I'll come in and I'll share a meal with you. In other words, I'll forgive you. If you just open the door, I'll forgive you. You, you open the door, you invite me in, I'll, I'll forgive you of your sins. And I will be reconciled with you if you just open the door and, and invite me in. He's communicating reconciliation. He's communicating forgiveness through that verse. You just open the door. I'm, I'm knocking. I want to come in. I want to be reconciled. I want to forgive you. You open the door and invite me in and I'll accept you. I'll, I'll forgive you. This is why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, was buried and resurrected so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to God. So Isaac here you know, this king that just expelled him from their land comes to him now seeking a covenant and Isaac makes a feast and he's communicating acceptance and forgiveness through this feast. They ate, they drank together. Then verse 31, then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in, in peace. And it came to pass, verse 32, the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, we have found water. The same day they find water yet again. What do you see in the story of Isaac? Des despite all of the strife and the contention and the hardship, God is blessing him throughout. God is blessing him throughout. God continued to bless him despite all of the opposition he experienced. You know, it's been said that Abraham was a man of altars because Abraham built an altar everywhere he went. Jacob is a man who dwelt in tents because he liked dwelling in tents. Isaac was a man of wells because everywhere he went, he dug a well and he found water. Everywhere he went, God blessed him. Everywhere he went, he just had the hand of God's blessing upon his life. In the midst of all of the contention and strife, God was blessing him. So finally, verse 33, he called the place Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Isaac faced opposition. He faced contention. He faced strife. But Isaac trusted the Lord. He walked by faith. And God blessed him everywhere he went.